Can you sign when they can start? Okay, ladies and gentlemen uh, here in the room across the world, uh, we're all here because of fusion. Of course, I mean the research here at JAT, but also in general, we are here uh, because life itself is based on fusion. All the energy we get from the sun is due to fusion energy, and it's the basis of the energy source in the heart of the sun. My name is Tony Donet, and I have the pleasure to lead your fusion, which is the world's largest uh, fusion consortium. Uh, we are 30 national research institutes in the EU, in the Ukraine, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. And we are all working together to bring the day closer that we can use fusion to provide clean, safe, and abundant energy for future generations. On the screen, you see the logos of the 30 national laboratories, but behind them, there are 150 universities, companies, and organizations. And in Europe, wide, there is about 4,800 scientists involved in the work of Eurofusion. But today, we are to here to talk about the landmark fusion results that our researchers have achieved at JAT, uh, the Joint European Tokamak, which is located at the premises of the UK Atomic Energy Authority in Cullum, near Oxford. Right now, JAT is the most powerful fusion experiment in the world. Like other tokamaks in operation, JET can heat materials to uh, t fusion temperatures of 150 million degrees, which is already 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. And we can hold the resulting charged gas, which we call a plasma, with magnetic fields. JET is also the only fusion experiment worldwide with exactly the same inside materials as ITER will have in the future. But what makes JET really exceptional that is that it's the only device which can work with the hydrogen variants deuterium and tritium, or called, also called heavy, water, uh, heavy hydrogen and super heavy hydrogen. Deuterium and tritium will make up the fuel mix for both the international ITER fusion experiment, but also for future fusion power plants. Using the unique combination of capabilities is exactly what our European collaboration of scientists and engineers has done over the last six months. Fueling JET with a deuterium tritium mix and combining all the fusion know-how which we developed over the past decades, we overcame one hurdle after another to produce a sustained fusion plasma that released 59 megajoules of fusion energy in a five-second pulse. The five seconds seems short, but that's the operational limit of jet copper magnetic field coils. And it's also, uh, let's say, the maximum time we can operate because we don't actively cool our inner components. I should mention explicitly that we did not produce more power uh, from fusion that we needed to keep the reaction going. That is something uh, which is, uh, let's say, on the agenda for our successor ITER. Instead, our experiment showed for the first time that it's possible to have a sustained fusion process using exactly the same fuel mix planned for future fusion power plants. During the campaign we carried out over the last six months, we gathered a wealth of interesting scientific results that will give guidance to ITER. And this is the cake which will be presented uh, to you today. The world fusion energy record is the icing on the cake. I would like to highlight here the fact that the experiments have been conducted in extremely difficult uh, circumstances because of the pandemic. Uh, we had uh, a minimum number of people in the control room, and most of the European scientists, they uh, were uh, in the control room via a remote participation. During this press conference, my colleagues will go into more details about the results we achieved, what we have learned, and also what it means uh, uh, for the quest for fusion energy. Let me very shortly lay out how the session is organized. We will open the event by two speakers from a political background, the UK Minister of Science and the EU Ambassador to the UK. Subsequently, the CEO of um, the local host will present you the high-level results that we have achieved. And then we have a speaker from the ITER International Organization to briefly explain what this means for ITER. Then we have a break with a Q&A session. And after that Q&A session, we have three of our leading scientists explaining you in more detail um, the icing, uh, sorry, the cake itself. So what are the details of the results and what did we achieve? Um, so we are now ready for 
the first uh, stage. Uh, so first we'd like to welcome to the stage uh, the UK Minister of Science, Mr. George Freeman, uh, followed by the EU Ambassador to the UK, His Excellency Joao Fale de Almeida. Uh, please, gentlemen. Tony, thank you. And um, I don't know about you, Ambassador, I feel slightly underwhelmed in the shoe department, uh, the Johan Cruyff of European fusion science. Uh, thank you, uh, Tony and Ian and all the team for having us here today and for taking the time to show us this remarkable facility and uh, for the data you're about to announce, uh, which is quite extraordinary. Could I first of all welcome his Excellency Ambassador uh, Joao Valet de Almeida. We have mutual friends in Portugal, and uh, it's lovely to see you here. Welcome. I've come uh, hot foot from Switzerland yesterday, and uh, seeing CERN and seeing the excitement of the ITER plans and the, the excitement about what's happening here is truly a recognition that science is a collaborative venture and Europe is a powerhouse of science, and we want to remain fundamentally part of that. JET and, of course, Horizon and Euratom and Copernicus are all flagship examples of the power of European collaboration and show what happens when we allow scientists to come together and work their magic. And the truth is, this is a magnet not just for extraordinary applications in energy, but it's a magnet for talent, a magnet for collaboration and for international uh, science. And we're very proud to be the host of it. I'm very struck uh, seeing what's going on here that uh, like sort of modern day knights of the round table, uh, these extraordinary scientists have demonstrated that fusion is not just a legitimate but is now uh, within grasp a serious offer in the long term energy mix and we know how urgently we need new solutions for global energy if we're going to constrain global climate to 1.5 degrees, uh, the urgency of which was highlighted at COP just a couple of months ago. And that creates both an extraordinary scientific challenge for the world, but also an extraordinary economic opportunity for those of us prepared as we are to lean in and lead in developing those technologies. And it's very clear to us in the UK and to me as a newly appointed Minister for Science, Research and Innovation, that if we're going to be the science powerhouse we aspire to be globally, we need to grow and build on the development of the sectors in which we've already led and work collaboratively in no more sector more urgently than in energy. And the biggest challenge I would suggest the world faces alongside feeding 9 billion mouths on half the land area with the same energy and water in the next 20 years is to find sustainable sources of energy. And this technology behind us is a fundamental part, I would suggest, of the global answer to that. And that's why we have identified fusion quite explicitly in the Prime Minister's 10-point plan, in our R&D strategy, and in our innovation strategy in Bayes as a technology of tomorrow that we are committed to supporting. That's why we've already committed over £222 million for the first five years of the STEP programme and a further £184 million to enhance the UK AE infrastructure. I know this approach works. And I say that not because I've had a glimpse into the future, although I've had a chance to look in the window behind, but because we've done it in the UK and other sectors. And as Minister for Life Science, 10 years ago, we set out in a sector there, a mature sector, but struggling to cope with the scale of technological change. We set out a 10-year bold public and private co-investment plan. And we launched as part of that a series of big initiatives. I would suggest that the genomics program to be the first nation to sequence 100,000 NHS genomes was the step program of life science. And it has had a catalytic effect. Uh, when we announced that we were going to sequence 100,000 genomes, we'd spend 186 million with Illumina. People said, well, isn't that a, a picking winners with one American company? Well, it's triggered a huge wave of investment in genomics and allowed us to be able to sequence the COVID virus and develop the vaccine. I think the technology behind us here is the genomics program of 
future energy. And I think in 10 years, we'll be seeing this beginning to be deployed as a part of our energy mix. So if I sound confident that we can do it, it's because I've seen firsthand, uh, both after a career in investment in the private sector, the power of when public and private come together as the power when countries come together. Uh, if you can imagine in energy, in fusion energy, achieving what we've achieved here in the UK and in Europe in life science, the gene sequencing of the virus, the vaccine, the fastest ever clinical trial, 10 times bigger than the, the next 10 in the world done in months. The scale of the ambition is similar. So in some ways, my mission in this role framed by the Prime Minister was this, do on for life science what we did again, and for three other sectors of which the first is fusion. And we are absolutely clear that we're now on the uh, hockey stick of adoption and commercial adoption of this technology over the next 10, 20 years, uh, both here in the UK, in Europe, and globally. And it's not just, of course, the scientists working here that will benefit from this. It's not just the incredible cluster of technologies and companies beginning to come here, and we'll be looking to support that cluster as it grows. But it's also, all around the world, people in countries that are short of energy, that are looking at the development curve, the agricultural industrial revolutions they have to go through, wondering where we're gonna supply the energy for sustainable development. Well, I want to suggest that it's being developed here and in ITA and through that collaboration. So it's a hugely proud moment for the UK to be handing on the baton internationally. This facility was a groundbreaking investment by the UK, a groundbreaking decision in the 19, late 70s, the Concord of fusion energy, and we're now working with our European partners to take it to scale. We're also determined to make sure we adopt it in our energy mix and make clear to the energy sector that this technology is coming. Ambassador, thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. And we look forward to working with you and with colleagues across Europe on this and the related science on the frontier of tomorrow's economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you all for, for coming. Thank you for inviting me and my team to, to this event. It's a great honor to be here. Let, let me start with Portugal because we have many common in my home country, uh, very good ones in fact, but uh, I was happy to be welcomed to Cullum with Portuguese weather this morning. So uh, it's great to have sunshine and, uh, and we walked around the, the village uh, close by. I felt, I felt at home, uh, I felt at home and meeting you and talking about common friends. Uh, but also I'd like to uh, say that we absolutely share and I absolutely share your belief in cooperation. Cooperation among scientists, and this is the result of cooperation among scientists, but also cooperation among nations in whatever framework, before as members of the European Union, now as partners across, across the channel. I think there's a future for cooperation among scientists and among nations, and I think this is the spirit, I think, that unites us here uh, today. It is indeed uh, a great pleasure for me uh, to, and a great honor to represent the European Union today at this uh, breakthrough uh, ceremony. Uh, I want to congratulate those who are the main responsible people for this breakthrough, and those, they are the scientists and the engineers of the Eurofusion uh, Consortium, uh, which includes the UK uh, Atomic Energy Authority, and 29 European uh, partners working jointly at the joint European Toros. Today, scientists and engineers, today is your day. Through your hard work and your great skills, you have achieved an unprecedented record performance for sustained fusion energy. And I wish to congratulate you on behalf of the European Union. Your results are the clearest demonstration of the potential for fusion to deliver a tremendous source of low carbon, safe and sustainable energy. The power of the sun harnessed on Earth. I think we should not be afraid of those words. These are the words that should drive us also towards the future. Remarkably, your work builds on the unwavering efforts of many before you, of European fusion scientists here at JET over the last 40 years. This is a long-term effort, and I think we should pay tribute to all of those that contributed before uh, all of us. You have yourself prepared uh, the way for the next generation of European scientists, the younger generation will, will continue 
to advance fusion science and technology at ITER in the south of France and beyond towards commercial fusion energy. Perhaps the most important news for the future of fusion energy is that a quarter of the 300 or so European scientists and engineers who delivered today's result are belong in fact to the younger generation. So there is a future for fusion energy also in terms of the scientific community. Uh, dear friends, a JET was born as a European undertaking, a joint undertaking as we call it, and it has very much remained a European adventure, bringing Europeans from across the channel, from across the continent, and with great pleasure, many from the United Kingdom. Over the years, uh, the European Union has funded about 80% of the costs of JET operation, and we are proud of that, and we will continue to support uh, these uh, uh, endeavors. The overall figure is half a billion euros in the operation and scientific exploitation of JET. Again, we are proud of that, and we are very happy to see the results of uh, that effort. We will not stop here. We will continue. We have committed already 600 million euros for further funding of Eurovision and Eurofusion until 2025, and we re remain committed as ever to ITER, which is the next stage of this uh, adventure, and we support largely the construction costs of it. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, as, as we celebrate Her Majesty's uh, Platinum Jubilee, uh, it is worth, I believe, remembering the start of this adventure here at Cullum. Back in 1984, some of you were not born yet, back in 1984, in this place, <clears throat> Her Majesty opened officially the joint European toys. With her was the President of France, François Mitterrand. As France had at the moment, as today, by coincidence, the presidency of the Council of the then European uh, Community. The President of the Euro European Commission was here as well. And I've seen coming out of this room the pictures of many European leaders that visited Jet. As President Mitterrand said at the time, together everything is possible. Eurofusion scientists have proved him uh, right. Last week, I had the wonder to visit this same place and to meet uh, His Royal Nihilus, uh, the Prince of Wales, on his visit to JET to acknowledge the success of this operation here. Almost 40 years ago, the tale started. Now the tale is becoming, is becoming true. Her Majesty said uh, then, as she officially opened JET, all of us here today may have a tale to tell our ch grandchildren when we say that we attended the unveiling of the joint European Taurus at Cullum. You can be sure I will tell my three grandchildren. The minister is too young for that, but I'm sure when he gets there, he will do exactly the same. Because we are proud of what we achieve, we want the, the younger generation to reap the benefits of what is being done here. So, to all the scientists, to all the engineers, my congratulations. To all the governments that provided support, thank you for that. And my last word is to say, like, echoing what the minister said, let's continue to cooperate among scientists and engineers, let's continue to cooperate among countries, wherever they are, under which contractual relationship. And that's what I look forward to have between the European Union and the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency Ambassador. Um, for your very interesting and inspiring speeches, your support for fusion energy in Europe and uh, the research uh, here in the UK is what makes it possible for us to pursue this great goal of making fusion an energy source for the future here on Earth. I now would like to call to the stage Professor Ian Chapman, the CEO of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, which is one of the 13 uh, national laboratories which is involved in the exploitation of JET 
but who also then uh, operates that on uh, behalf of Eurofusion. And at the same time, I would like to call Dr. Tim Luce, ITER Deputy Director for Operations and Science, to the floor. So maybe you can take these two stages. Good afternoon. Is that me? Good afternoon. Good start, isn't it? You okay? Happy? Can you hear this? Okay, right, I'll carry on. Um, look, thank you very much for being here. Uh, at the same time as we were doing the experiments that we're about to tell you about, the UK was also hosting, as the minister said, the COP26 conference. Um, David Attenborough opened that, that event and by saying, and I'll just quote, if working together, sorry, working apart, we are a force powerful enough to destabilize our planet, then surely by working together, we are powerful enough to save it. For the last four decades, um, JET has been that beacon of international cooperation. Um, if we are to deliver fusion as part of the wider effort to address climate change, we must do that by working together. We are hugely proud of the collaboration in our community. Fusion has been described already even today as a quest. I think that's a very apposite word. A, a quest is noble. It's something that matters. Um, it really matters to our planet, to our people. But a quest is also characterized by challenges to hurdle, by adversities to overcome, often obstacles that you don't even imagine at the start of the journey. Uh, and I'm gonna talk through some of those recent successes on, on that quest. JET is, as you've heard, the only magnetic fusion device which can operate with the real fuel that fusion power plants will use, with deuterium and tritium, two types of hydrogen. Look, we did this in 1997, and those results from that, that, those early experiments established the design basis for ITER. Um, here's a picture of ITER. Tim will tell you more about ITER in a moment. ITER is the largest scientific collaboration ever undertaken by humankind. In my view, perhaps the most important. And it will aim to prove that fusion is possible on a commercial scale. ITER is progressing very well. You'll see some evidence of that shortly. But JET remains today the best place to prepare for ITER. It's worth just outlining the steps to fusion power plants. JET is, and, and always was, designed to be an experiment. The power needed to operate that experiment is far greater than the fusion power that it produces, primarily because the magnets that were available when JET was built in the late 1970s and early 80s are copper magnets, and that requires a lot of electricity to operate them. Since then, Superconducting magnets have been developed, and, and ITER will employ superconducting magnets, which use far less power. And then in the future, power plants, which have the same amount of power to operate, will produce yet more fusion power, and that means that there'll be a net gain, a net electricity production that ultimately we put out onto the grid. Um, the basis for ITER was taken from these 1997 results. Back then, as you can see here, we achieved 16 megawatts of fusion power at its peak, but in that instance, we did not sustain the fuel. We did not sustain the fusion. In fact, the energy record where we actually sustained fusion power for five seconds was 22 megajoules. And as Tony said already, that the, the five seconds over which we operate is actually determined by the time that we can operate the magnets before they get too hot, made of copper. Now, whilst that sounds short, five seconds tells us much of what we need to understand about the dynamics of the fuel. Um, in many cases, those dynamics happen on much shorter timescales. But really, it's the 22 megajoule line here that we've been trying to improve on in our recent experiments. But, as I said, fusion is a quest, and we've had some unexpected hurdles. Um, since we discovered, uh, since we, we did those results in 97, which provided the basis for ITER, um, we subsequently discovered that a lot of our tritium fuel, one of the types of hydrogen, ended up trapped inside the wall. Um, and indeed, the amount of fuel that got trapped inside the wall was too large to be sustainable in power plants. Um, so we undertook a major engineering project 
um, to change the whole of the inside of the wall of jet. That's 16,000 components, four tons of metal, and all of that was done using some of the most sophisticated robots on the planet. Now, having done that, we then needed to demonstrate that the first hurdle was overcome and that the amount of fuel trapped in the wall was genu genuinely much lower. And you can see that that is very much the case. Um, indeed, the fuel which is trapped in the new wall um, is more than 10 times lower than in the old wall. But that gave us the second hurdle on our quest. The ETA design relied upon our experimental data laying on this dashed line. So we needed our data to lie on the dashed line as the, the old gray curve did. However, when we operated with this new mixture of metals on the inside of the wall, we could not achieve the same fusion performance. But we trusted the scientific method. We trusted the ingenuity of the brilliant people that work in this consortium. And through perseverance, through ingenuity, through invention, our scientists and our engineers found ways to recover. And we recovered the fusion performance. And that confirms that we have confidence that ITER will meet its goals and that we have a pathway beyond that to power plants. So on the basis of that, we were ready to try to do better than we did the last time we operated with tritium. And that's what I show you here. So if we compare the best sustained performance from 1997, we've now extended that record up to 59 megajoules now sustained, done with genuine fusion fuels, and now for the first time ever with a compatible mixture of metals on the inside that power plants could use. These are genuinely landmark results on that quest to delivering fusion power. Um, we've set a record, but actually most importantly, we've established really high confidence that ETA can reach its goals. We won't stop here. There are many hurdles yet to overcome. We don't even know what some of those challenges are, but we know that we will have more challenges on that quest. ETA itself will bring new science, new learnings, essential lessons that we have on the way to power plants. But these results, if nothing else, prove that through the ingenuity of people and by working together, to paraphrase David Attenborough, we are a force powerful enough to overcome them. Thank you. And over to Tim. So I'm Tim Luce. I'm the ETER chief scientist. I'm also head of science and operations uh, for the ETER project. As has been introduced already, JET is the nearest neighbor to ETER, and a lot of the results feed into how we're going to not just design, which has already been done, but build the, but operate the ETER tokamak. So our mission is to demonstrate the scientific and technical feasibility of fusion power for peaceful purposes. Now, the, the, the men and women who constituted the project defined that very specifically for us, how we're going to achieve that goal. Two of the physics objectives are these, that we're going to reach 500 megawatts of fusion power for at least 300 seconds with an energy gain of 10. And by energy gain, we mean the core plasma generates 10 times more power from the fusion than was put into it to heat it up. We're also supposed to demonstrate in principle steady state operation, about 300 megawatts for up to an hour. So this be, these two metrics, the fusion power and the duration, place ITER in the power plant class. It will not be a power plant, but it places ITER as a power plant class facility in terms of the scientific achievements. We'll also begin to do some of the technical achievements. And the ITER organization, as was uh, said before, is not just a single political entity, but it is a, an organization responsible to its members. And its members are the governments of China, the European Union, India, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the Russian Federation, and the United States of America. So two-thirds of the world's population have joined together to try to achieve fusion as an energy source for peaceful purposes. Let me show you a bit about where we are with ITER. This is a very recent photo of the site. Uh, my objective here is to prove to you that ITER is not simply a paper study. It is, a, it is becoming quickly a reality in terms of being able to operate plasmas for fusion conditions. 
You can see a lot of the facility is already constructed. About 80% of the civil construction is complete. In the foreground, you see the cooling facilities, the background, the electrical facilities. These are already been taken over uh, by my department and in operation. The centerpiece is sort of the silver building in the very center, and that's where the tokamak is being assembled and then placed into the tokamak pit for its final assembly. Let me show you some photos of that. This is uh, May 2020. Uh, so in the midst of the pandemic, we launched the assembly of the tokamak itself. This is the cryostat base. So you can imagine that, uh, as Ian said, superconducting magnets are going to generate the magnetic field for the conditions uh, for the fusion in ITER. Uh, this means it needs to sit in a giant thermos bottle. So we're making 100 to 200 million degrees Celsius in the middle while the magnets are four degrees above absolute zero. Uh, we have to separate those by the magnetic field, but we also have to separate the four degrees from the ambient conditions in France. And so it sits in a giant thermos. This is the cryostat base. The first event was actually one of the hardest. This is one of the heaviest lifts. I think it is the heaviest lift we'll do with the overhead cranes. This piece weighs 1,250 tons, and it's just the base of the facility, 30 meters in diameter. This is it in place, and you can't see it anymore. This is sort of a feature of tokamak facilities, that once they get built, you can't see the individual pieces anymore. So the base is down there. The lower cylinder of the cryostat has been welded onto it. There are actually two of the poloidal field coils in the bottom. The, the objects in purple are the, the gravity supports for the toroidal field coils. The centerpiece is not a, a permanent fixture, it's a, a tooling fixture to hold the vacuum vessel and the magnets in place while they're being welded together. This is the assembly hall. Uh, it, it looks just like a, a simple building, but this is from 50 meters up. So the object in the bottom is one of the toroidal field coils uh, in the bottom right-hand corner. It's 17 meters tall if it gives you an idea of the scale. Those two little V-shaped tools that look quite small, those are 22 meters high. Uh, so everything is, is a larger scale than you can really capture. There are actually people in that picture, and I'll, you can look at it later and see if you can find them. It gives you an idea of the scale that we're working at. So this is the first vacuum vessel sector. On the right is the uh, sector with the thermal shields in place, and on the left is the toroidal field coil, and you can actually see its companion behind. So the tokamak is made sort of like the slices of an orange. It has nine pieces that have to be put together because it's too heavy to lift as a unit into the tokamak pit. This is the same object now assembled together. This should be uh, within a month lifted into the tokamak pit as the first uh, tokamak piece to go into the, the pit for assembly. The second one is also there. You can see there are two of these tools in operation in parallel. So the first, the one in front is the, the second sector. The one behind is the one I showed you before. Okay, but I don't wanna focus on the Eater project. Today we're here to celebrate the success of the JET results. And why are we talking about ITER and JET together? Well, as was said before, JET is the nearest neighbor to ITER. It's the closest we can achieve now to the fusion conditions, but also some of the technical actions that have to happen in the ITER project. So I want to focus on a few things. I'm just going to talk to this slide about the, the impact of the results from the JET campaigns on the ITER operation. So let me start with the signature result, the one that's been talked about, the fusion energy result. That's really focused at this goal of generating 500 megawatts of fusion power for 10 seconds. So if you recall in, in Ian's picture, there was a, the potentiality of fusion power was shown in the first uh, deuterium-tritium campaign. But as Ian said, that wasn't suitable for operating a power plant. We needed something that lasted. So it was sort of uh, like the 100-meter the, the meter sprinter, and we needed a marathon runner to build a power plant. So the JET team came back after that event and started focusing on extending the pulse. How can we make something that was in principle stationary so that it could be used and qualified for a power plant? And that's really the, the significance of this signature result for ITER and for future devices. It's showing 
an existence proof that there is a way, and in fact I've been told that there are two ways that have been qualified to achieve these types of conditions. This is very, very important because as was said before, the wall materials are the same, uh, the operating scenario is the same, and so in terms of the ITER research plan, we can move forward. It might seem paradoxical, but it was alluded to by Tony and also by Ian about the challenges that were faced. Uh, ITER project is different than some of the other big science projects that you might know about. It doesn't have an infinite life. The ITER members chose specifically to make the ITER agreement a fixed duration. I think to focus our attention on achieving these objectives that I've put in front of you, we need know-how. And to make that ITER research plan work effectively, we need to know also what doesn't work. And so the know-how that's been gained in this good result entailed finding several things that didn't work or obstacles that you needed to find a way around. And that information is equally as valuable as that signature result itself because it will enable us to accomplish the ITER research plan in a timely fashion. This is very, very important. Especially because it's been done with deuterium tritium fuel and with the wall materials that we will be using in ITER. This was a bold choice on behalf of the ITER, of the JET project to adopt the ITER-like wall. Uh, the research could have continued forward in any way. It would have gotten a signature result like this in DT, but as Ian said, it would have not had the properties that we need. The, the boundary conditions that we face are critical to how the fusion uh, plasma performs. So the fact that this is done in the conditions as close as possible to the eater tokamak uh, is very, very important. Other issues, uh, other physics things, I won't, don't want to preempt the future results, but uh, they're go you're going to hear about self-heating. Uh, the charged particles from the fusion reaction are 20% of the energy from the fusion, but to get to a gain of 10, they have to be two-thirds of the heating power. We must rely on that heating power. If it is not predictable and reliable, we can't achieve that goal. JET is the only facility where we can learn about that. So we are very anxious to hear about the, the outcome of those experiments in detail. Tritium retention, this was alluded to also. We have limits. ITER will be the first device that has nuclear regulatory licensing put on it. And we have a certain amount of tritium that can be retained in the facility. The choice of wall materials is very important, and JET has explored that extensively, and we'll look forward to hearing the results from that. Turning to operations, um, to make this facility work, you see behind us a mock-up. We have remote handling, safe handling of tritium, safe handling of beryllium. All of these good practices will be incorporated on the return of experience to ITER. It gives us a step up and a step ahead. These things are all significant and very important, and we're very much looking forward to seeing the, the totality of the results in, the, in their full analysis being provided. As a closing comment, let me say, um, I know what it takes to do a work like this. It's an enormous activity. There are a lot of people that have to be involved, the women and the men in the operational teams and the scientific teams have spent an enormous amount of time and effort under challenging conditions to make this happen. And so um, many in these teams have been my colleagues and friends for my career. And I just want to give my, my personal uh, congratulations on a job well done. And on behalf of the EATER organization, I want to thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for these um, nice presentations. I uh, would like now to open the floor for the first uh, Q&A round. So if there's any questions from the press, I, I got some already via internet, but maybe there's press here who has questions. So please ask, and then we see who best uh, can answer the question. Fantastic. 
Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, it's Tom Clark here from Sky News. Uh, Ian, you mentioned in your introductory remarks the challenge of net zero, 2050. With today's results even, do you think fusion power is in reach of that kind of timescale? Could we see fusion power in time to make a difference to our energy challenges? Yeah, I mean, I'll answer that question two ways. I mean, we want to go as fast as possible. Everybody in this room, everybody in our community is here because we want to address climate change and we want to find a sustainable form of energy. Um, to, the, to the point of in time, fusion will always be in time. You know, whenever, whenever we get fusion to produce net electricity, it will be a valuable asset to the portfolio of carbon-free technologies, actually irrespective of when it comes, because the demand is only going up. So it's always important to do fusion. And of course, we want to do it as quickly as possible. The European roadmap aims to get to produce net electricity by 2050. So that's what we're aiming for. Um, it's a bold and ambitious thing, but that's what we want to do. Yeah. Question? Thanks. Um, so, maybe a question for Tim Luce. The ITER means journey. How far along are we on that journey? <laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, so, the, if you're talking about the timeline, the official schedule for ITER is first plasma 2025 and to extend these fusion power results 2035. So it's a, it's a progressive commissioning of a machine. It's the normal sort of sequence of any nuclear facility. You have to go through a sequence of steps to, to qualify for your license. That said, uh, the Eater Council has uh, asked us, based on the present performance, to look at a revised timeline. And uh, that is happening this year, so I can't give you any kind of update on what that would be. But it will be an incremental change, not a substantial change. They've asked us to try to maintain the, the deuterium tritium uh, start of operations by the end of 2035, and we're doing our best, but I can't give you an answer beyond that. But you've seen the construction. It is, it is a reality. Despite the pandemic, we've actually been able to do a substantial amount of the assembly work that's needed uh, on the site effectively. Where we're facing the challenges actually is in the delivery of components. From the biggest things, the simple things like wire connectors. The supply chain has been decimated by the, the COVID pandemic and it's hitting uh, in a lot of different places. So. Thank you. I don't see immediately questions here. So we had some questions. Um, we got here a question from Tom Borden from iNews. Uh, it's taken 25 years to double. Uh, are we talking about another 25 years before it's viable much quicker? Maybe that's for Ian too. Sure. I mean, so, so in response to that, as I said in my, uh, in my comments, fusion, fusion is, is very much a quest. The, the whole doubling in 25 years, well, we weren't intending to do that. We weren't trying to do that. We were trying to prepare for ITER, and, and ITER was based on the, the first results. We then realized that we had over other challenges to overcome. What we're presenting today is that we have successfully overcome those challenges. It's all down to the ingenuity of people and the team. But the things that put it, are put in front of us, we are finding a way to overcome. So we have a high confidence that ITER will reach its goal. And as Tim said, ITER's goal is to produce a 10 time power gain. You put 50 megawatts in, you produce 500 megawatts. That machine will turn on in a few years' time. So. The progress is, is really impressive in our field, and we are moving forward on that quest. OK. Um, uh, so may, well, maybe, uh, Tim, you can, can answer this one. It's from Simon Roach, Channel 4. How much further does this bring us to actually having usable industrial scale fusion energy? And what's this result of surprise? I, I think you know enough of it to <laughs> basically answer this. Okay, so um, as you'll see in the briefing later, the result isn't a surprise, it's actually an accord to prediction. And this is a fundamental um, result, actually, that fusion is predictable. This will help us uh, when you talk about timeline. If fusion is predictable, then we can optimize without having to do it by, by proving in some sense. We can find our way more effectively. Um, in terms of, of making fusion uh, quicker, I think, was the question. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it, as I said, it, it allows us to, on the eater side, advance 
uh, through the research program, but I think the, the question was specifically about technology. And what's been demonstrated here, importantly, is the use of remote handling to handle large objects, to handle sensitive materials uh, safely and effectively and within, within the government regulations. And so these capabilities are necessary elements for fusion to advance. So I, I think this, this result and the work that enabled this result from the technological perspective are absolutely critical for bringing fusion into reality. Okay, thank you, Tim. I have here three questions. They come from Dan Clary. I can try to answer them myself. Um, so I start uh, from the bottom of this question. What was the capital Q for this shot? So capital Q is the ratio of the power we get out of the plasma compared to the power we put in. Capital Q was 0.33, so we need three times more power put in the plasma than we get out, uh, but which in itself is also world record. Um, then what's the future of JAD and will there be a DT3 uh, campaign? At the moment we have a plan to continue with JAD until the end of 2023, including a short DT3, so we still have almost two years to further work with JAD and to optimize. We are very dependent here on the politicians, both at the UK UK side and in Europe side. What is absolutely important is that we get an association agreement of UK to Euratom, because then we can work and we can continue work. If that not happens, then we at least continue chat until the end of September this year. We will conduct a campaign which is very high priority on the list of ITER, which is the helium campaign. Uh, we do that here. We back that up by another helium campaign at Aztec's Upgrade, which is a smaller tokamak in uh, Munich, near Munich in, in Germany. And this will give further input to ITER. But uh, without the association agreement, we're not sure whether we have the financing to continue. But the plan is there. Uh, are there more questions from the audience? Um, I see we have one. So maybe one more for, um, for, for Ian. Uh, if things do go well, this is from Tom Bowden. Uh, when do we see nuclear fusion starting to be deployed as domestic energy source? And uh, when do you think it will be in the UK and the UK and typically delivering uh, 10 or 50 percent of the energy? Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly our aim. As I said in my answer before, um, the European roadmap is that we will progress towards a prototype power plant which produces net electricity by 2050. Um, we, uh, here in the UK, uh, we also have a domestic program which is aiming to do a, a similar thing, maybe a, maybe a little bit earlier, um, for net electricity with a different concept. Um, the, the, the burn time in energy is long, so by the time you, you go from a prototype to, to generating 10% of the demand within the population, that's, that's dictated by economics and how fast you can roll out the plants. Now, um, it's, it's very hard to say with any certainty what the energy climate will look like in 30 years' time. Um, what, will, what will exist for carbon pricing? How will new technologies be brought to market? What will be the subsidy policy? All of these things are unknowns, and they fundamentally affect how quickly a new energy source will roll out. So it's very difficult to say how quickly fusion will penetrate into the market. I, I, I often get asked this question, and I, I refer to Lev Artsimovich, one of the inventors of the Tokamak concept, who was asked this question in a press conference decades ago and said fusion will be ready when the world needs it. And I firmly believe that that is still true today as it was then. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both gentlemen, Ian and Tim Luce, for their presentation and their answer. I got the sign that we now need to move on. So thanks. And uh, now we are coming to the cake. So you had the icing. And uh, we have three of our top scientists which are uh, coming on the stage uh, now. The first one is um, uh, Fernanda Rimini, who is the JET Senior Expectation Manager, followed by Dr. Constanza Maggi, JET Task Force Leader, and Dr. Atina Cap Capato, uh, Scientific Coordinator. So please, uh, the floor is yours. There. Good afternoon. Um, I will take a few minutes of your time to expand a little bit on the 
background and the context of, of the results that you will then hear. So as you've heard before, we believe, and all the other contributors to this, to this uh, announcements believe that JET is a stepping stone to fusion, a crucial stepping stone to the fusion energy. And this is because JET is the closest in size to ITER, because the plasma facing wall is the same as ITER. You see here, in green you have the beryllium, and in red at the bottom, in what we call the diverter, you have the tungsten. And this is exactly the same thing that you see in its bigger on, on ITER. And JET, again, is the only tokamak in the world that is capable of using deuterium tritium fuel, which is what is going to be used in the first generation of power plants. The, the ITER-like wall, in particular, comes from this observation in DT1 that the fuel remained trapped in the carbon wall. The carbon wall was very nice, but it was the traditional kind of a plasma-facing wall for, for tokamaks, but it trapped, uh, it trapped this, uh, the, the hydrogen and the variants of the hydrogen. The metal wall doesn't. The metal wall does it a lot less, and it, retains, it really retains far less fuel. However, what happens is that the plasma facing, what, what are the components facing the plasma, impact the behavior of the hot plasma. And that meant that we needed to spend a significant amount of time, sort of the last 10 years, re-optimizing the plasma. And this is not just, this not just led to the, to the results that you see today, but it's also a learning curve because it's an input for the ITER research plan. When you have a new machine, and in all intents and purposes, in 2011, JET became a new machine, you need to learn how to use it to get to the highest performance. And now, we've sort of, uh, uh, we felt that it was the right time to go back and do DT in these conditions. But we didn't change, we didn't just change the wall. Uh, we also improved our methods of finding out what is happening in the plasma. This is what the methods of measurements, these are the diagnostic, and we have hugely improved diagnostics. And also, and this is not just a jet, but sort of across, across Europe and across the world, in the last 25 years, there has been a great progress in the theory and in numerical modeling. So by putting together the, di the data that we have, the improved diagnostic capability, and the fact that we can now make better interpretation and better prediction means that we can, uh, we are more confident in what is going to happen in the, in the way uh, and future machines uh, are going to behave. My last slide is on the fact that really this is European collaboration at its best. Uh, this is the result of the efforts of an international team of scientists, of engineers, and of technicians. And these people have come really from institutes all across Europe, even further afield uh, in the world, to plan, to propose experiments, and to operate this machine. So, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Uh, so, in what follows, we are going to present now just a selected uh, few of our highlights. Of course, you can imagine we have a very um, extensive set of uh, many results that we've been delighted to, to collect uh, last year, but only there is time only today to really choose a few key items. So, this is we're going to go through uh, in a little bit more detail. So we're going to show you first how uh, we went further in understanding the impact of the fuel mass changes on the plasma properties. Uh, second, uh, we have shown uh, um, uh, that we validated an, a novel method in DT plasmas, a uh, novel method for heating, uh, which will be relevant in ITER. We have provided new and more extensive measurements of the alpha particles that are the, the, the product of the fusion reactions. And it was already alluded that for us, perhaps this is the main result, has been to see that uh, the, the DT results that we've obtained in, in our high power discharges uh, are in line with our modeling predictions. So this is the, 
very important. And then we're going to show how we have achieved and even surpassed the, the target uh, record of 50 megajoules of energy production in a DT fuel plasma with iter like wall. So, as I said, so this hasn't been really mentioned so far, but this is a very important uh, thing to know that when we, we change the mass of the fuel in the plasma, so in, for instance, if we go from the lighter hydrogen uh, protium uh, to a heavier uh, variance, deuterium with mass 2 or tritium with mass 3, this does change the property of the plasma itself. And so we need to know, yeah, so we need to understand these changes uh, because this is at the basis of our, of our models, in a way, when we predict fusion performance. And so in particular, we change the flow of heat and particles. We change how the plasma itself, which is very, very hot in the core, remember we have up to 100, 200 million degrees temperatures, how this interacts with the inside of the wall that contains it, uh, and vice versa. So there is as a mutual interaction between the hot plasma and the, and the wall at the side. And this is very important for future power plants only for optimizing JET in DT and for ITER, but also to go beyond. And, and because JET is the only tokamak before ITER comes into operation that can operate using this DT fuel mix, we've actually complemented our DT experiments with a series of systematic studies when we change the, the mass of the fuel from protium to deuterium to tritium. And, and it's the combination of all this that provided the full understanding. So here I'm going to give you now a couple of examples just to get a feeling. Um, so one thing to know is that uh, in JET, like in most tokamaks and ITER as well, of course, uh, attains the best performance when we operate in a so-called state of improved heat confinement, which we called H, H mode, high mode, high confinement mode. And, and we only get there if we inject enough power above a minimum, which we called power threshold, at this point. Now, this H mode power threshold has a complex dependence on many plasma parameters, and one of them is the plasma density, as you can see in the, in the plot shown there. But also, when we change the fuel mass, this does affect this H mode power threshold. So, for instance, we have different values whether we operate with a full deuterium plasma, like the, the, the blue points, or we are in a 50 50 DT mixture. So, one of the results, uh, one of the key results from last year was to show that this relation holds also with the new wall, and this is very good news when planning uh, for ITER operation. As I said earlier, while we change the fuel mass, this does affect also how the heat and the particles flows in the plasma itself. And we gather uh, an understanding of that, for instance, from measuring parameters such as the temperature or the density of the, of the plasma itself which of course we could do very well already at the time of the earlier DT experiments in 1997, and indeed we had already observed this. However, at the time, we didn't have the extensive diagnostics we have now, and so for instance, we could not measure a very important region of the plasma, which is the, the very edge, where the, 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 the plasma is, is cooler and, and less dense because it goes towards the interaction of the wall. And now we have got, gone back to, to this characterization, and here I'm showing you, for instance, an example of when we varied uh, in experiments the fuel mix in the plasma by progressively increasing the tritium content, and you see from the blue to the green to the red dots, and you can see how that impacts in a different way the temperature and the density of the plasma. Of course, it's the product of the two, the pressure that, that we're interested in here. So, as I said, we didn't have this in 97. At the time, I was a young scientist. I was here as part of JET team in DT1. Uh, so for me, personally, it was extremely exciting to see these measurements coming to the fore last year when we finally obtained these results. This also has been alluded to already, and then maybe we can go a little bit more in detail here. Um, we have done these experiments with an eater like wall, because as you've heard, JET discovered that you know, we couldn't uh, carry on with carbon because that was not efficient for a reactor. And, but an important question for ITER, of course, is what is the erosion of these components, beryllium in the main chamber, tanks in the diverter, when we operate with a hot DT fusion plasma? Yeah, and JET, JET is the best environment, I would say the only environment, realistic, close to ITER, that, that could test that. Um, 
so you can imagine that if we were to have an excess um, uh, influx of tungsten, this would pollute the, the plasma through cooling it, and this would decrease the, the core fusion performance. So that was a very important thing to study. Um, we have demonstrated, we've seen that there is an, indeed an increase of erosion due to the heavier tritium ions, as predicted uh, from theory, both for the tungsten and beryllium. But we've also shown very clearly that this is well within tolerable limits in view to ITER. So you, you've just heard that some of the material from the wall ends up in the plasma. For example, we have a tiny amount of beryllium naturally inherent in this plasma, but we use that. For example, here we have demonstrated a heating method that actually heats those impurities, which in turn then heat the deuterium and tritium plasma. This is based on techniques that we already have before, so heating the plasma with radio frequency waves, but it's a new technique utilizing the fact that we are just using the wall materials to heat the plasma. It's a technique now demonstrated at JET, and we can directly apply it then on ITER. But of course, as you've heard also today, we don't want only to externally heat the plasma. We eventually, in a future machine, we want the plasma to heat itself. And this is the role of the fast alpha particles being born by the deuterium tritium fusion reaction. Alpha particles are helium ions. They carry a lot of energy, and they should transfer this to the plasma so that the plasma can keep going with the deuterium tritium fusion reactions. So in this experimental campaign, we have created pulses with sustained high fusion power in these DT plasmas, which allow us to investigate these effects of the alpha particles on the plasma. What we see is that the alpha particles are triggering a kind of a high-pitched ringing in the plasma, as you see on the bottom right plot. This is the characteristic signature of those alpha particles, and this is something we predicted. Information like this that we get in this type of pulses on the behavior of alpha particles is valid for any magnetic confinement device that's very useful information for the step ahead. But you can imagine that such hard work for this special experiments, the tritium, tritium plasmas, the jet is the only machine that can do them. The work has started before. And in particular, we have predicted what will happen. We have used our models with our based on our physics understanding to predict what would happen in these experiments. What you see here is the fusion power produced on the y-axis versus the power that we put in for pulses in the so-called hybrid scenario. So scenario is simply a way we run the plasma. The color shaded areas are the predictions of the models. So these are different modeling codes, different assumptions. And we're very happy to see that our experimental data, these are the gray points, match these predictions. This is a very important result. These are the models we are using to predict fusion in future machines in ITER. And we now also have a wealth of data that we can even more strictly check and validate those models and go ahead with even more confidence. But of course, you also heard today about record fusion energy. So I would like to take you first one step back a few years ago. You've seen this plot already. So fusion power back in DTE1, 1997. High fusion power was achieved, but for a short time, but also for a more sustained manner at a lower level, ending up with 22 megajoules of fusion power. So what you see here, this blue curve, is from the hybrid scenario type of pulses that we saw in the previous slide. And these are the first ever high confinement plasmas using deuterium tritium in beryllium tungsten walls, such as that that will be used on ITER, and making sure that we keep that wall intact, as you heard before. So we have made a great progress, and we are achieving high fusion power and sustained for five seconds. This is done in a plasma with a 50-50 deuterium-tritium mixture, but we knew that we can also do better than this. So by adjusting the plasma parameters, by going a little bit with more tritium, so tritium-rich plasmas, we get the red curve. This is the record fusion energy ever made, 59 megajoules. All of this data confirm our predictions and advance our understanding and how we develop high-performance scenarios to be done on ITER. So all in all, all the hard work, as you've heard already, of so many people, scientists, engineers, technical staff, has been met with success. Some of these people are, as you also heard, the new generation that can transfer this knowledge and skills to ITER. We have tested deuterium tritium fusion in ITER-like conditions. We now know more about burning plasma physics than before. 
We have validated models in our hands. We can extrapolate to next fusion machines. And we have demonstrated the highest ever fusion energy production in a single plasma pulse. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Fernanda, Constanza, and Atina. Um, so the floor is again open for questions. Uh, are there direct questions here from the press uh, presence? Otherwise, while you might be thinking about questions, I hear one from Alf Kuhn Zeeman. Um, he asked, the fusion power of the new record shot is still varying in time. In the beginning, for example, it jumped from 13 megawatt to 9 megawatt. Is this intentional due to some varying of the plasma configuration, or are there instabilities? So I can take the, I can try to answer the question. Um, so what you see here, uh, what you're implying also makes sense that the fusion power output does depend on how the plasma behaves and other processes there. But what we actually see here, direct response of the input power we put in. So this is the power we put in has a, a similar waveform. This was not intentional in a sense, but as you can imagine, to get this very high performance pulses, we drive all the systems to their limit. We want everything to work perfectly simultaneously, and this is just a consequence of that. In other words, what we even see here, uh, it takes a little bit more digging, but what we see is that the plasma even manages to withstand all these difficulties, the external heating that we put in, and manages to say sustain for a long time. You can, you can refer back to the plot you were showing before that shows that the fusion power is such a steep, the previous one, is such a steep function, exactly. steep so function see, of the input the power. The fusion so power is a, a function of the input power, and the more input power you put in, the more fusion power you're getting out. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, here is one from Tom Borden, uh, iNews. Uh, I feel uh, like I'm always reading about new fusion breakthroughs. Uh, we had recently the 1.3 megajoule from NIF. We had East and China delivering 1,000 second pulses. Uh, we had K-Star, 20 seconds, I believe. Uh, so uh, what, is, what is really significant about this result compared to the other? I think, well, it's, it's, first of all, it's very, very difficult to compare what we find in a magnetically confined fusion with what happens in, in inertial fusion. So it's very difficult to compare us with NIF. So I will leave that aside for the time being. I think the, the ITER uh, research plan needs input from more than just one machine. So although we are the closest, we are the only ones who can do deuterium and tritium, it doesn't mean that um, other machines around the world cannot contribute. And in particular, the new superconducting machines in China and in Korea are giving uh, contributions in terms of very, very long pulses. But if you look at their performance, first of all, they cannot operate in deuterium tritium. This is absolutely unique for us. Some of them are also um, not, not with the full metal wall. But uh, also the temperature is much lower the, the, so the plasma, the plasma is kind of colder and less dense. So in terms of performance, the performance of jet, even excluding the fact that it's in deuterium tritium, is, is closer to what ITER will be. But we need contrib ITER needs contributions to all of them. Okay, here's another question. So 59 megajoule is just an abstract number. But if we compare, how, mu how much fuel did you actually use for getting this 59 megajoule? And can you say something how much fossil fuels you need to create the same amount of energy? Yeah, okay, so I, I will take this one. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the, 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 so let's, let's talk about the 59 megajoules uh, we injected. So as we heard before, this was a slightly tritium-richer plasma. So we had 0.1 milligrams of tritium and a little bit less, so of the order also 0.1 milligram of deuterium. So very, very tiny amount of fuel. Um, to generate such large amount of uh, fusion energy for five seconds. If you compare it with fossil fuel, that would compare with burning or the order one kilo, one to two kilos. So this is, uh, shows you that not only we want, we're going in the direction of clean, ener clean, uh, clean and green energy supply, but it's so much more efficient. Okay, I got a question. In, in principle, you answered it, but may, maybe uh, let's address that. So what, what limits the jet operation to five seconds? Why not longer? Shall, shall I go? Okay, so I think this was already touched by various people before, but we can, we can remind you. 
So the limitation at high power, we have two stresses, five seconds. If we go at lower power, we could go into 20 seconds. But still, the limitation is due to the fact that jet has got copper coils, and when we operate, then at a certain point they heat, so we have to stop and cool them down. And this is why then, as a function of time, the superconducting technology was developed already K-STAR and EAST are using that and testing them, as Fernanda said, and ITER, of course, is going that direction. But the important point here to note is how these five seconds relate to the important time scales of the plasma, which is, after all, what we are studying and what we want to improve. This is already quite long enough to give us confidence that, you know, when we go to a super, superconducting magnetly uh, device, you know, we, we can extend that. And this is why, because, for instance, five seconds is already more than 10 times uh, the time where the energy or the heat is confined in the plasma. Already of the order of three times, you can confine the alpha particles. So this is a very important figure of merit. It's not five seconds, it's not just a number. It's a very important number that gives us confidence that, you know, when put in our models, we can make progress uh, as we move to ITER and beyond. Okay, here I have a, a, a kind of philo philosophical, strategic question. Why didn't you do all these experiments before ITER was defined? Um, so, can ITER cannot change anymore? So, yeah. I, can, why, why now I, and I, why didn't we do this 20 years ago? I, I, I can continue if you like. Or you would, would like to? Please. I, In I a sense, continue. you can reverse this. You can reverse these questions. We did these experiments first. Jet was the first one to do the deuterium tritium experiments, first in a little bit in 1991 and then in 1997. So this, is, this was the basis for designing and building ITER. Uh, the, the 1997 uh, experiments have given the sort of the insight in what a deuterium tritium behaves in a carbon wall and pushed for the design of a metal wall. So in a sense, we have done them before, and now that we have done them again, improved in the right conditions. Um, it's exactly so. Maybe also to, to, to supplement a bit more, we are continuing to impact uh, the ITER research plan. The design uh, is done, and ITER is being constructed, as Tim showed. But we are continuing to give a contribution, in particular JET is a huge risk, mit risk mitigator for ITER. So we continue to address points where we think we're accelerating uh, ITER's progress and we are also reducing, so we are finding out first a lot of things and, and therefore helping ITER to pr um, proceed faster and, uh, and, and more cheaply. This, this is already answering the, the, pre the other question I see here. Um, but then a question, we have also many, many privately invested companies around. This one actually very close to here, Tokamak Energy, the CFS in, in the United States. And uh, of course, anything we do, we, we publish in, in public literature. So also these companies working on these very aggressive approaches, they read what we're doing. So is any of you afraid that, let's say, these companies take all our results, they do the research, they cut us off, and they have fusion much earlier than we are? On the contrary, not, not afraid, but happy, I would say. I mean, we're all in this together. We want this for, for everybody. We need, as we heard many times today, we need fusion energy production. Um, so this is not a competition. This is, this is science. So everything that is, we learn here at JET and everything that one can learn in other uh, machines, this can all be combined together. The physics, the basic physics itself is the same. Um, of course, one can always argue that we have been following this path towards fusion energy. The roadmap goes stepwise from JET to ITER to the next uh, machine, the demonstration power plant. And of course, this, these recent results give us more confidence towards that direction. But uh, it's very good news that more and more, uh, we hear more and more about fusion, that we, we see this being a success in many fronts. Thank you. I, I think I'm through the list of pre-printed questions. Um, let me see whether there's any questions further from the public here, from the press. If not, then uh, I would like to thank all three speakers. So, uh, thank you very much.
Well, we, we have reached the end of the event now. Uh, so apart from being uh, informed about the latest exciting jet results, I do hope that you have also seen a glimpse of how the European fusion scientists have continued to work in a united way in a time which is subject to some political hurdles. We all are very eager to continue this very good relation across the uh, channel, uh, so between Europe and the UK, and well, the same holds for our Swiss colleagues, of course. I can imagine that there's still some people and uh, people from the press which want to uh, further interview people here, the speakers or other people of the team then please contact our um, uh, outreach people, the communications people. You have their uh, communication details. You can find them also on the website, which are on display now. And uh, the people here will be available to answer your questions, um, either by telephone, by uh, Zoom calls or whatever. So we are available also in the coming days. So thank you all for listening in, all the people worldwide, whatever time you are. I'm um, quite happy that we could share these results. We are very excited and uh, we are not done yet. We will continue JET uh, in the coming months and do further exciting experiments. But we were very happy to share that with all of you. Thank you.